Hey everyone, welcome to Career Journey Podcast. I'm your host, Brittany Avila. Have you ever wondered about ghostwriting? When somebody writes either an article you read online or even a book, but it's attributed to someone else? Today's guest, Daniel Rosehill, talks all about his adventures in ghostwriting. We'll even get into topics like discussing the differences in education systems from Ireland and the U.S., And he is available to help anyone that's interested in writing as a profession and specifically ghostwriting as a profession. And you can find him on his website, DSR, that's D as in Daniel, S as in Sam, R as in Robert, DSRghostwriting.com. Or you can find that on our social media pages. And he offers help with getting into ghostwriting and and writing in general and figuring out and navigating kind of that world. So if you're interested in that career, be sure to check out his website and enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Career Journey Podcast, where we explore exciting careers and how to get them from the people who flipped it. I'm your host, Brittany Avila. Thank you for tuning in and enjoy. Hi, Daniel. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, Brittany. Thank you very much for uh, for having me on the show. Yeah, absolutely. So we just start from the very beginning. Did you have any dreams or aspirations of what you wanted to be when you were a child? I didn't really have uh, specific aspirations. I more had kind of a uh, amalgamation of sort of different images at various points. I believe I thought about being an airline pilot. Um, I definitely dreamed at some point of getting into like political communications and like speech writing. That was a big thing. I went through for a few years, actually quite late in life, like when I was in university. So I had a few, a few things. I think the, the, the kind of aspiration that I have throughout life is, uh, is, is more just like running a startup. That's kind of a recurrent <laughs> one that I have a brilliant uh, startup idea every now and again. Um, but no, I don't, I, I never really had a kind of, uh, you know, in, you know, the way some people dream about being a brain surgeon from the age of like four years old, I never exactly had something so specific more just uh just a series of uh as i said ideas <laughs> um and so how did you start getting into any of your careers did you have to decide on something in high school when you were trying to go to college or how did you get into that sure so um i like the way you use the word careers there because uh <laughs> it's uh, that's really the i think the, the way you have to look at it so yeah it's and and college actually because so basically i grew up in uh in uh, ireland for sort of the point i was like 10 years old onwards we lived for a few years in uh abroad before that But the Irish education system um, is basically geared around, you do this exam called the Leaving Certificate, which is like the equivalent of SATs, basically. And based on that, when you apply for college in Ireland, and I know it's uh, different systems in different countries, so where I'm currently based uh, in Israel is, I think, a little bit the same system. Uh, You basically say what you're going to, you declare, I think you can correct me if I've got this wrong, but I think the American terminology for this is you declare your major uh yeah. like you, you you state what you're going to be studying so that's a definitely by 18 years old people have to have made that decision but realistically to actually do the right exams for that course you need to make the decision you know a few years earlier so wow. yeah I, I i remember you know my uh my mother and my you know family were maybe more keen that I would do sort of scientific and mathematical subjects and I was yeah. never math was never my uh you know strong point I'm more creative and uh just work better with words I guess so yeah I mm-hmm. kind of unconsciously is what I'm trying to say did start making those decisions at the age of like 15 16 and most most people do that uh, unless you're as I said what in the category of the brain surgeon super genius children who at five years <laughs> right. old know that they need to be doing brilliantly in math just to get into the right course. Uh, it's more, I think it's a little bit unconscious. It kind of happens. You pick what you want to do in high school and then that sort of ends up determining what doors are left open to you for university. And then as we, as we know, that has a big 
impact on uh, what you can do later in life in your in your career or next career. Right. And do you have to stay in the same major? So you have to pick a little earlier than I think we do here in the U.S. In the U.S., I mean, you can declare your major when you're applying to university, but you can also declare to be undecided or change. Are you able to change? As far as I know, you can. So basically, the IRA system uh, goes by, they have this uh, points-based system, which really fluctuates on supply and demand. And uh, you basically apply for certain courses. So I, I think there, you know, there are mechanisms. I'm sure for changing between different choices, but um, it's not very, it's not as fluid from what I understand uh, as the US, where you know, as you can change around undecided. And I think they even have these free form programs, if I'm not mistaken, that are yeah. you kind of put together your own uh, your own credits to make a course. Uh, so no, it's quite a rigid system, as I said. So is Israel, from what I have been told by you know people of that age living here. So I guess mm-hmm. systems are, systems are very different, and it's actually interesting what kind of effect that has on people's trajectories. I guess I I, I personally, by the way, think it's a it's a very very bad system to, <laughs> to fence people into what they want to do at like eighteen years old. Although I guess on the other side, people would say you you have to decide sooner or later, but. Uh, I certainly wasn't thinking, you know, lifelong careers at the age of like 17. I don't think many of us are at that time. I mean, the brain's not even fully developed and you have to pick the rest of your life. Sounds pretty intense. Right. It is intense. (laughs) Especially now. I think that the, the market and the economy has changed a lot since maybe the beginning of these structures where you can move around a little bit more freely than before as well. Yeah, um, that's true. But I mean, at the same time, I think there are a lot of people who, you know, once you've once you have committed to doing something, it's kind of hard to. I know there's a big thing here, as I said again, where I'm based mm-hmm. with these uh, boot camps, like coding boot camps. So people will roll out mm-hmm. these uh, programs to teach people Python or various uh, front end development languages in a abbreviated time frame. So. These have become popular, but they're not. Uh, at the same time, those people are still at a big disadvantage to you know people that did a a full computer science program. So yeah, it's a it's it's tough. It's tough the way the system is based in some places. Yeah, and so what did you decide on? Was your major at least? That's what we call it. I don't know what it was called in in Ireland. Yeah, I had I had like a crazy crazy journey uh, towards even getting there, and I ended up doing something not particularly exciting. So I I remember <laughs> doing that. The only reason I even well, my wife's American, so I now know what SATs are. Just would know, but uh, at the time, I actually looked at going to uh, college in the U.S. and I ended up uh, mm-hmm. applying, getting into a couple of uh, places, and then realizing it wasn't so practical because of the, I guess, the cost of uh, college and the in the u.s is just absolutely mind-boggling so i did the yes. same thing in the uk so i i don't exactly know what was going through my mind but i ended up you know getting into like a few different universities and then going just to my local university and studying mm-hmm. all i was also applying for uh crazy programs like i've always had an interest in aviation i think i mentioned that already mm-hmm. uh i remember there's a university called cranfield in the uk that operates these crazy like airline transport management majors that nowhere else exists so i ended wow. up staying in cork uh i think partially for partially for family reasons my father died just before just after i finished high school so i think it was potentially partially motivated by maybe i wanted to just stay where i grew up but i ended up not doing any of these far-flung ex- exciting plans and i studied law uh which okay. uh again was i think maybe partially what my family strongly suggested i do and not you know wasn't really something to be honest that that i particularly was interested in i mean I, law is a bit interesting but i, I didn't have the you know, the passion. And I think the stuff I was thinking about studying myself, computer science, um, probably would have actually been maybe a, a better fit. So yeah, that's, that's my, that's my story of, of, uh, declaring a major in law somehow. <laughs> and what was that experience like? Um, it was, uh, you know, the first year I remember being very interesting, uh, that actually kind of, um, I guess we'll segue, we'll segue into this. Um, the first year was interesting because there was a lot of like constitutional subjects. So I know in the U S as well, there are aspects of law like jurisprudence that are really interesting from a non 
legalistic standpoint and then you then after that you get into like contract law and case law and it gets really really detailed so for the first year i remember being very engaged by it and i enjoyed the college experience and then um because i was already actually at this pla- at this point thinking about um moving to israel that was another one of my options um i I just find it really hard to motivate myself to study all these minute minute i'm gonna get this word wrong minute you know all these fine details of irish contract law um so i i mean i did end up i passed the degree and you know got my i didn't i didn't drop out or i didn't quit the program but uh I didn't have the passion, basically. Uh, so it was a, it was a relatively short course. It's a three year program. Um, oh wow! Yeah, it's a three year program, and I also I also uh, I also stayed at home, which is a really common thing in Ireland, and uh, that is like one of my biggest regrets in life is doing that. Don't don't do not waste your college years living with your parents. It's it's <laughs> such a terrible idea. Oh. So what, what did you do after? So if you graduated with a degree, um, it sounds like you didn't want to use it in any way. So what did you do? Right. So through it's kind of through this uh, program, I, I did some relatively interesting or creative things. So I got into writing for student newspapers. And um, I think that's, I don't know if that's a common activity in the U.S., but um, I kind of ended up taking it too far. Like I got so into it that it sort of absorbed me. So I started out writing for the student newspaper. Then I started up a news website for the university because it was weird that even in uh, 2009, it, there wasn't any online news for the university. So I started up a news website um, basically because I wanted to do an internship in a newspaper and I was like I'm not going to scan copies of you know (laughs) stuff from the student newspaper and that ended up becoming quite a big you know in relative terms thing Um, I did run that for a year full time so then after this degree was finished I was like journalism is fascinating and it's such an interesting field and I mean I did I, 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 I still get really that's where my passion really is uh like i love interviewing people and understanding stories and so that was it so i i got i got sidetracked um by my foray into student journalism and then ended up actually doing a master's degree after the same painful process of uh <laughs> exploring um like exciting options again i actually got into another university in the u.s and the same story i realized that it it was just sort of not not sensible i mean i don't think it's certain professions it might make sense to take on huge tuition fees so i I got into Mm -hmm. columbia essentially and this isn't uh this isn't an attempt by me to brag about that fees but uh when i looked at their fees it was you know i don't i'm sure columbia journalism grads uh do relatively well in the media industry but you're just not going to claw back that massive debt in the same way that like, you know, a law graduate might. So I ended up studying journalism in a uh, college in the UK called uh, City University, uh, which is Mm -hmm. well regarded in the UK uh, and obviously was like a lot cheaper than studying in the US. So (laughs) that's what I, that's what I did. Yeah. It's pretty outstanding here and it just keeps climbing. (laughs) Yeah. It's um, I, I I don't understand the whole, you know, I, I mean, I know how it works. The people get into debt and then they gradually pull their way out of it. But uh, I, that's, I mean, if staying at home for college is one of my big regrets, not taking on student debt is one of my not regrets because, you know, I (laughs) I think it just puts a pile so much pressure on young people to, uh, to have that. Yeah, I didn't even take out that much in loans, and I'm still paying mine off. So I oh, think you uh, just keep paying it off until you die. <laughs> good luck. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay, so you wanted to go into journalism because you were having that sidetrack. So what did you do after you graduated? What was kind of your first job after graduation? So my first job, so I ran this um, student newspaper gig, um, well, website. Um, then there was a mm-hmm. business incubator. So I did that for a year. That was technically, I mean, sort of a job. Um, but my first job job was um, I came back after finishing this journalism program and was hired by um, a guy who runs a uh, political app for politicians brendan finucan still going mm-hmm. ecanvasser ecanvasser.com uh very and they, they've done very well um so that was a really cool experience so basically i managed marketing communications at a startup 
Um, nice. And I did that pretty much uh, until I left for Israel, uh, you know, give or take a couple of months. Mm-hmm. Um, I love there's this theme that you have kind of political science, a startup, kind of communications and storytelling interweave through all of these jobs. Yeah, all of these if, majors. If you- Right. If you if you come up with an answer for my career by the end of the by the end of this, I'll be very grateful. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. And then what did you do after that? So I did this job, and um, as I, said, I really really enjoyed working at that startup. It was uh, I still say probably the best job that I've had. Um, it was very small at the start, and now it's uh, they're more established. They're still based in Cork in Ireland. So anyway, I did. Um, I moved to Israel. So this this was um, for you know religious reasons. Uh, I'm not sure if you know your listeners are familiar with the whole general dynamic of uh, Jews returning to Israel. But that was um, that was it, it was really personal. It wasn't. It had absolutely nothing to do with career stuff. And in fact. Uh, it was very unfortunate that I didn't look at that aspect of it. Um, okay. You know, I just thought this is what I'm going to do and I want to do this and I want to try it out. And I didn't think really so much about the jobs aspect. Mm-hmm. So I got to Israel. Um, I did a, the introductory stuff is like they put you through this language school. And um, yeah, that's, um, it, Will I continue with what I did after coming to Israel? There's not really so much to tell, but I can I can tell it. Hmm. Okay. So I did um, language school, and then I, um, you know, the first summer I worked at a newspaper, actually, uh, very briefly at the Jerusalem Post, which isn't even on my resume because it, I just kind of saw it as a as a part time job. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was my first job here. Then I uh, transitioned into a, uh, then I got a full-time job uh, at the end of that summer, the first summer at a PR company, um, IOT company, marketing communications there. And now I'm working for myself as a, as a doing a, a ghostwriting business, which is freelance writing for the most part and some book ghostwriting as well. Awesome. So how did you transition from working in that marketing job to starting to work for yourself? Um, so basically, I mean, I think actually when I moved here and I was job hunting, there was just a lot of people looking for a freelance writer. So I was like, okay, I'll open up a, a file. It's very, very, um, the, the good thing about freelancing, you know, sometimes depending, I guess, where you live, but the bureaucracy wasn't really that involved. Even in Israel, there is a lot of bureaucracy, uh, mm-hmm. but it was quite easy. So I just set up an account and started billing clients. Um, I then freelanced for a while for even, you know, when I was working intermittently. Um, and then basically I build up uh, just enough clients, uh, in order to be able to go out on my own. Um, so I just made that decision basically at that point. Great. And can you walk us through a little bit for those that aren't familiar with kind of freelance writing? How does that work? Sure. So, I mean, freelancing is, you know, I, without oversimplifying, so you don't have a sing. you're not working for a single, um, client or employer. Typically I'm, I'm going to try and make this, you know, universal. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't get benefits generally, which is a, a, a part of it that a lot of people don't think about. And, you know, just to spell it, spell out what that means. That means you don't get sick days. You don't get vacation pay. Um, if you're in the U S I believe it's really tricky to get healthcare. You need to like, you know, find a way around that. So, um, that's what freelancing and freelance writing. I mean, it's actually a pretty big, uh, world, even though it sounds very monolithic, there is people who do social media posts. There's people who do books. There's people who do all sorts of different types of freelance projects. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'd be happy to explain what there is involved in it. Yeah, go for it. So basically, yeah, to get into freelancing, um, I mean, from a technological standpoint, you, you're probably good enough with just a basic website and an email. Um, so the barriers to entry are, are pretty low. Um, it's generally, I mean, there, there are courses and books about what to do. Um, but yeah, once you have a website and an email address, start finding clients and you just write for them, basically. Um, that's <laughs> that's what is entailed. But, you know, of course, there's an awful lot more than that. There's marketing, business development, administration, contract work. Um, there's a, there's a lot that goes along with it. But, you know, to actually get going is relatively easy. And I know that a lot of people, um, because of COVID, are exploring this as an option at the moment. 
Right. Um, and it sounds like for us in the U S who kind of need the health care tied to it, it might be good for that supplemental income sometimes. Right. Just, and then you've mentioned now, so now you do ghostwriting, which is tied a little bit to freelance. Can you explain kind of ghostwriting to us? Sure. So, um, I mean, ghostwriting is traditionally, if you if you read books about it, the traditional paradigm, if you will, for ghostwriting is, ghost, is writing books. So, mm -hmm. you know, throughout history... Um, let me let, let me roll back in that because I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I can't say in uh, you know in the 15th century people were hiring. I don't think we have that kind of information. But throughout <laughs> modern history, um, a lot of books you read on the on the bookshelf by famous authors, especially by serial authors, particularly, mm -hmm. are not written by those people. Celebrity wow. memoirs, people probably know that just intuitively. Yeah. So there's a big network of, uh, there's a big world, I should say, really, of uh, writers for hire, contracted writers who actually write these things. But that's just actually the books. So traditionally, ghostwriting mean, means books. Um, mm -hmm. I would say it's a little bit of a debate uh, in that people would ghostwrite social media and say, I'm a ghostwriter. So to me, ghostwriting is simply, if I write something and my name doesn't go on what I write, I would consider that ghostwriting. So before I spoke to you, I wrote an article uh, for a tech publication and they're going to attribute that to their staff, not me particularly. So that's a form of ghostwriting, but it's an article, not a book. So you have different, so that's a big market. Um, people who write speeches are ghostwriters. They typically call themselves speechwriters. And I've made the point on blogs I've written that, well, a speechwriter is just a ghostwriter for, you know, people delivering spoken remarks. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, and uh, public relations firms fulfill a huge amount of ghostwriting for, you know, uh, CEOs, um, for people that don't have time to write. So basically what I'm trying to say is that an awful lot of what you come across in magazines, even on the internet, even on LinkedIn, even on Medium and on the bookshelf um, has not been written by the person who does write it, who is a ghostwriter, can be anybody from me to a secretary to a personal assistant to a communications manager various different uh titles okay and i know i've heard celebrities even have people write kind of what they talk about at award shows or even on tv things like that so that would be kind of fitting under that ghost writing right yeah sure i mean you could even have um you know stuff you'll see at a pr firm would be writing interview responses so sometimes a reporter will sit down with a celebrity to conduct an interview and that'll be on the record sometimes especially for online media you know it's just basically exchanging uh, word documents and the journalist's or blogger or whatever the case may be might mm -hmm. send over questions and you'll just respond, uh, in writing. So, um, those can obviously very easily, I, it's not something I do, but I do know that, uh, you know, from having worked at a PR company, let's just say I've seen that being seen that being done. It's, it, it is an activity that gets done. It's crazy. I think in, cause my line of work, I obviously read a lot of articles and things online. And so, blog posts and kind of articles for newspapers and periodicals kind of make sense to me for ghostwriting. Mm -hmm. Um, but you're saying that the largest part of ghostwriting is books. Um, so how does that work? Why does somebody kind of contract someone else out to write the book? And then how does that work with their name being on it and all? all of that sure so i mean some of the stuff that you mentioned there so there's a distinction that i think is a very important to draw between academic ghostwriting and what i call right. business slash corporate ghostwriting so you know there is a question is ghostwriting ethical and i've also blogged mm -hmm. about this um my, my kind of belief is that if you have a typical ghostwriting relationship between somebody who has really really interesting things to say but they don't have mm -hmm. the time to say it or the ability to say it. And you've got somebody who just does this continuously. They're continuously writing for clients and they're therefore really adept at that process of writing. I think that's a net benefit for the world. It's a, it's a positive collaboration because stuff things are getting written that wouldn't be getting out onto the bookshelf were it not for right. these, these ghostwriters. 
where I have a problem with it uh, is academic ghostwriting. So, you know, if you say I have to write a uh, master's thesis or a PhD dissertation and I want to hire someone, you know, I've been approached by someone uh, about six months ago and, you know, I got this inbound query and the guy was basically saying, um, I represent, it was super sketchy. He was like, I represent this guy doing, he's just gotten into an MBA program he's interested in a ghostwriting collaboration and you know i was like well what do you mean a ghostwriting collaboration so basically the guy wanted me to write all his coursework so that's <laughs> academic ghostwriting and that is not legitimate and the only reason i've written about this is just to try um you know underscore the difference to people yeah um i have heard recently though too in, in academic worlds for like major papers and research papers and grants there's a type of ghostwriting out there too. I would say there is an awful lot of it going on. Um, various shades of legitimacy, and uh, <laughs> you know, um, yeah, I, I think I think you'd you'd have to be pretty naive to think that this doesn't go on. Um, right. All all I'm familiar with, because you know, I've no, I'm not in the academic world. Um, the the ghostwriting that I know is you know endemic really is the corporate professional stuff the kind of thought leadership uh, that gets put out on these social networks I'd say and uh, a large amount of that would be ghostwritten. Nice. And can you walk us through the process, kind of from start to finish, of what happens? So you when you get a client and you're kind of working on a project, a book, kind of, can you walk us through that process? Sure. So, I mean, I had a discussion with a uh, potential client this morning, and that's kind of typical for an ongoing relationship in that you really want to have some kind of a, a relationship with this person, like uh, mm -hmm. basically not to skimp on the amount of time you would spend speaking to them these days on Zoom. Now, for typically for ghostwriting, whether you actually go out to get to meet the person uh, really depends on what level you're dealing with. Um, okay. So, you know, if you're dealing with the top celebrity level, then that really works through uh, celebrity agents, let's say. Mm -hmm. If you're dealing with uh, business people, um, often the relationship uh, is more one to one and you are just conducting, you know, you, there's nothing stopping you. So basically one of the projects I worked on in the last six months was with somebody local. So that was really nice in the sense that we, you know, could go out and get a drink at a bar. And that's actually super um, important and really mm -hmm. good because so much freelance writing is computer based. And I just kind of tried to embrace any opportunity to, to meet, to meet people face to face. So that, that was, that was a really nice relationship. And then, um, you know, with somebody in another country, uh, that I am also working on now, somebody in Ireland, actually, uh, we're just exchanging emails. So, I mean, you know, the modes of communication vary. Some people love, um, video conferences with webcams. Some people hate webcams. Mm -hmm. Some people just <laughs> yeah. like email. People have different preferences, but um, that's really what it is. And uh, as I said, if you're if you're dealing with like an oil magnate coming out with a uh, biography, then they might fly you out to you know the UAE to to speak to them. But if you're dealing at a at a lower lower level with someone you know not somebody with that kind of money to just dispose of, then there is. Uh, for, uh, most of those projects can just be conducted 100% uh, remotely uh, with the one caveat that I don't think there's any substitute for person-to-person -person relationships and communication. So um, I, I, you know, I do believe that the, the product might be slightly different, but in the Corona era, clearly uh, even stuff that would have been done in person is now largely being done remotely. Um, yeah. Yep. And how important is it to develop a significant relationship with these people does it help your writing significantly yeah i mean i think the the trick the trick of ghostwriting is getting capturing the the voice of the person that you are i mean that's that's kind of obvious right so if i write i tend to write in kind of a um I'm trying not to use the word eloquent. That's, that, that sounds too self-flattering, but kind of an effusive style almost. Uh, I'm like an academic kind of prose. That's my natural mm -hmm. style. Um, maybe I've just adopted it, but... And then some people write in a much more laid back and colloquial manner. So the first thing, um, you know, on all the projects I undertake is I ask people to show me stuff that they've been impressed by and that, you know, stuff they've written before and not had ghostwritten. So if they've worked with somebody else before. So just to understand what they write, like I do... 
I'll do stuff like um, watch YouTube videos of them speaking and listen to podcast interviews they've done just to understand. Basically, the, capturing the tone of voice is relatively straightforward. People speak in different registers. They speak different dialects of English. But mm -hmm. understanding the person is a lot harder. And that's the, that's the trick, basically, is, uh, you know, as I said, having a, spending time with them in order to understand what are they really feeling that you know that they want to write this book um what you know who are they exactly like what 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 are they trying to get across here um right. so you know it matters a lot more for a book you could probably argue than it does for an article where you have a very clear skeleton and a brief to follow but yeah that's basically it it's it's um it's really understanding where the person is coming from and that goes beyond just picking up their voice uh so i would say that is the key to it and do you ever find yourself like refusing to take a client or not working with a client because there's not a match between kind of your style and theirs yeah i mean i would say basically so i've been doing this freelance writing for give or take about five years which is effectively as long as i've been here i've been doing it full-time mm -hmm. for two years so i've you know i've seen i had quite a few clients over the years based in different countries because i work mostly internationally with international clients come across various working styles various characteristics and yes the fit is so so important um i mean i would refuse a project probably on it, 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 it to tell you the truth it really hasn't come up yet um that i would refuse yeah. you know because it's someone like here is the memoir of me cannibalizing my brother i, ha I haven't got <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't received such a uh, request yet um what but in terms of working style so yes when you are interacting with someone from the very first touch point uh when they get in contact to your first kind of interview it's really like i mean they say this for job interviews that people don't actually it's in an ideal world a job interview is a two-way interview process you know in reality yeah. a lot of people need a job and they're just like hoping to get whatever job comes is available but it's a two-way process so i look at it like that so yes i'm interviewing the person i'm seeing you know stuff that you, you you do come across uh what i would call classic red flags and a good example that i have come across many times unfortunately is people saying oh you know i've uh, hired three ghostwriters and they're all useless or basically just you know dissing <laughs> dissing freelancers so yes if i spoke yeah. to somebody and they told me that um i'm their fifth the fifth person they've contacted and all their other freelancers were useless or you know something like that then that would be a red flag to me and to be honest i probably wouldn't take on that project yeah, absolutely. There's a reason that five other people didn't work out. <laughs> it's super, super important. And I, I've basically um, second guessed myself far too many times where I have got this feeling in my stomach that something is just not right about the way this person is communicating. It can be as subtle as, you know, uh, uh, you know, you, you must do this. Uh, just use, you know, a lot of use of imperatives mm -hmm. in a brief, very, very small signs that I pick up on. And, you know, I sometimes I run it by a freelancing friend and I tell them the story and they say, Oh, you're overthinking it. And, uh, basically it's, uh, I, I don't think I've ever, that's a kind of a bull claim, but I don't think I've ever been wrong where my gut said, this is not going to work out. And the few projects that I've had that have not really worked out, um, just because of those dynamics were, were, were things that I did spot. Right. And then, so what happens after you start developing a relationship with somebody? What's the, next step of the process um i mean typically for you know as you said there's diff different projects uh, that you could put under the heading of ghostwriting it could be an ongoing thing whereby you are ghostwriting for somebody um on you know linkedin or medium and putting out this whole campaign that they're trying to become let's say a thought leader in a certain uh certain industry um so those are just basically ongoing relationships um i mean to the extent that to if it does carry on for um you know more than six months or into years you kind of become uh sort of close with the person in the sense that maybe you start exchanging whatsapps and uh mm -hmm. you know you might pick up a gift for them around the holidays you might give them a gift um it develops into a more, that kind of a relationship as opposed to you know i've never actually done work on upwork or one of these big freelancing marketplaces but that you know, those are very, strike me as very transactional uh, oriented marketplaces that it's just purely, right. 
you pay the person. So that's the difference. Um, I haven't been doing this long enough that I'm at the point where I could say I've become like sort of a, a, a scribe confidant to a royal family member or, you know, something cool like that. <laughs> but there is, yeah, definitely the, the longer you work with someone, those are really the beneficial relationships because one thing I will say about freelancing is um, client acquisition is really Tr can be really troublesome like you know i think the best way to go about this business is really to find a few good clients away you know do good work for them and get referred out um because whether you're cold pitching or whether you're dealing with inbound leads um it's just really tough work and i think the statistic is like 80 percent of warm leads in an industry like writing just don't come through for various reasons so you know you're going to be speaking to a lot of people uh spending a lot of time and getting relatively small business so yeah that's the long-term relationships and uh referrals are the name of the game and what's it like after the finished product is it like interesting is it pretty exciting to see your work even though it has maybe somebody else's name on it I, th I think you have to kind of detach. So um, you asked yeah. me, you asked me earlier about the about credit and attribution. So um, my uh, thinking earlier on, and I kind of I've gone back in this a bit. I really didn't actually want my name on any freelancing work whatsoever okay. um, because I kind of didn't feel like I really owned it. Um, I mean, even looking at it from a legal standpoint, um, typically the intellectual property vests to the clients and you basically get paid. Ghostwriting is a, is a contracted writing project. You don't publish stuff. I mean, you will find, I'm right. sure, ghostwriters that also publish, but basically you're being paid a sum of money to sit with the person, speak to the person on the internet, do whatever it takes to get a great book out of them, send mm -hmm. the book to them, and then they can publish it themselves or bring it to a literary agent and go through a traditional publishing route. So that's basically where your job ends. Um, now, of course, it's great if people come back to you, but um, you know, I think most people, you know, the the majority of people you're going to be working with are not going to be become serial book authors. Um, right. So if it's a book project. What he would say is um, you just kind of have to detach. So I, I basically do, is I'm keeping tabs on a couple of books uh, on Amazon. I'm seeing what people are saying about them on Goodreads. Uh, you know, I'm just seeing how they're doing generally. And uh, I was able to keep in touch with one of the authors just seeing, you know, how it's going for her. Um, but that's really the extent of it. Um, I do keep them um on my shelf, um, the physical copies just as, you know, just to, because it is kind of cool. I mean, if, if you want to think about right. the, the project that, you know, that something physical emerges from this sort of writing collaboration, but yeah, you can't, if, if you do think along those lines of you are going to be tormented by, by, you know, <laughs> someone else's name, then it's a bad fit. Um, so that's, but just, just to quickly address, um, attribution. So there's, that's, there's no attribution. Mm -hmm. which is the book is written, you know, by Brittany. There is co-attribution, which is like with or as told to. There's various turns of right. phrases that are used. And uh, that's really it. I mean, there, it's, it's one, one or the two. Okay. So it's a little bit more like working kind of in the business environment, the corporate world, where you're contracted, you provide a service, and then you're done versus kind of that, I hesitate a little because I want to say that creative world where you're publishing kind of your own content, you know, because you're still doing that creative side, but it's just a little bit more separate. It's a little bit more like that corporate side where you're so there's, contracting. Right, right. So, so you know, when you're looking at books, basically getting a, a lot of authors will tell you that writing the book was the easiest part of the journey. <laughs> All the work is in promotion, 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 marketing, yeah. marketing, marketing. So yeah, that's basically up to them. As I said, I'm sure you will find, um, it basically the reason the distinction exists um, besides stuff like convention is, is uh, a lot of it's got to do with legal stuff because the publisher, you know, typically assumes legal responsibility. So you wouldn't want to be in a position whereby you ghost wrote a book and you published it for them. There is a whole landscape for this. So you'll have people who actually take the book 
and they format it for paperback or for ebook mm-hmm. and then that goes to the literary agent if you know if you're at that scale um, and the literary agent introduces it to publishers or you can do that so yeah there's various people involved at various junctures of this and uh, as far as i've seen it would be uncommon to have a ghostwriter who also had a little publishing sideline and you know offered post publication marketing as well i'm not saying it couldn't be done but it uh yeah it's not typically not typically like that yeah i mean if anything that would just be way too much work <laughs> yeah yeah they, yeah right it would be it would be like a very very <laughs> very burnt out person but yeah it definitely yeah. the the marketing work after you published a book is where the is where the really hard graph starts for for a lot of authors great and then what do you suggest for somebody that wants to get into this career? How does somebody get started doing this? I know earlier you mentioned just kind of building a website. Is that all it takes? Is there advice you have on on how to kind of practice or Sure. So I mean for for freelance writing, so some people for for ghostwriting, my conception of ghostwriting is that there are different markets. Um I sometimes call them different worlds because to me that's almost a more accurate description um of how the kind of different price points we're talking about here. So one is upwork, let's say, which is I would say a very, very unfavorable marketplace for the most part to sellers then you have uh, business people um which are typically you know business coaches and just r- sort of run-of-the-mill people looking to put out a book um mm-hmm. those those will, those will typically be more those are not through a platform they'll typically be you know higher value contracts than upwork jobs and then at the top you might have as i said um celebrities uh famous business people that kind of thing and that are you know able to spend up to six figures on uh, a book ghostwriting project so depending what level you come in i mean if you're a lot of authors do ghostwriting so if you happen to be a published author um you have a really good in to that world because a you'll probably know you might know a few literary agents and b you'll have good writing samples out there so the first question any writer gets asked is can i see your samples so actually the more um the more writing you've done ironically as a ghostwriter um the easier it will be you know for to have that to have that uh conversation because really all clients want to see is can you write Uh, that's something i've come to realize over the years like you know i've put together my portfolio and that's that's a whole other complicated aspect of ghostwriting is how to show people ghostwritten work because you typically can't just put it out on the internet and say you know oh Brittany, she didn't really write that book i wrote that book (laughs) you know that would be that, that would be bad um so that's a complication and i put a lot of time and effort into this only to realize that people are just looking for a basic reassurance that uh, my writing is good and that I'll be able to do the job. So that's what I'd say. So basically, you know, get your writing out there. Of course, in better uh, publications, higher tier publications is always uh, advantageous. Um, and, you know, beyond that, a professional web presence. Uh, getting into books, books is like its own world, essentially. Um, mm-hmm. So you will have the freelance writing uh, universe, um, which is very, very big and very varied. And then in books, it's its own sort of thing. Um, There are less book ghostwriters. There are a couple of uh, professional associations. I'm a member of one called the Association of Ghostwriters, which is AOG. Um, So you can check their website. They have two levels of membership and eligibility criteria there. Um, So that's, yeah, I mean, to make the leap into books, it's like everything. The first one is going to be the first three to five maybe are going to be the hardest because you're not going to know what to charge. You're not going to know how to do it. You're not, you're not going to, you're going to have a very hard time finding the first person to take you on without having mm-hmm. written one. So the, the more ways in which you can stack that in your favor by writing a book or by getting a warm introduction from a network to somebody, as opposed to finding, trying to find somebody on Upwork, um, the easier that that process will be for you essentially. Right. And you mentioned how difficult it can be to get your portfolio together and and convince people that you've written one or two. How do you overcome that? How do you get your work in front of them if you're not supposed to really show them sure so i mean it's it's a common topic of conversation in writers groups um so what I've done is i've kind of personally taken quite a strict view of it like I don't want to have on my website 
the names of anybody I've written for. That's 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 my personal uh, way to do it. Mm-hmm. Some people will put up articles that they have ghostwritten. Um, I mean, okay, so basically what I will do is I have, you know, a password uh, secure login area in which I'll have some samples. For other ones, I'll attach them by email if I have permission. Then you have stuff, you know, like legal NDAs, which again, I've signed NDAs with agencies that say that are actually, and this is becoming a growing trend which is really really tough that'll say like you can't say you've worked with this client you can't Mm -hmm. show your writing for them so you're completely restricted so that's really that's really tricky i have a few i have a few pieces in that category so what i do in practice is if i can i'll put some behind the password i'll share it with people i'll you know link to an amazon book and say i'd be happy happy to put you in touch with x to talk about my writing that's kind of the best you can do as far as I can tell behind putting it behind closed doors, closed digital mm-hmm. doors. Um, other people will put it up on their website for the world to see. And I'm, I'm just not comfortable with that because I kind of feel like what was the point of hiring a ghostwriter for the ghostwriter to tell everybody that they wrote the thing. So <laughs> okay. it, it depends. I'm not saying my, my way is the right way, just that there are various ways in which people do it and people will tell you their way is correct and other ways are, you know, whatever. Yeah, it just sounds difficult to be able to. to it's it yeah. I mean, it's it, right. It's harder. Than, it's harder. It's harder than being a journalist and just you know setting up a muckrack profile or putting all your clips on a page and saying here's everything I've written. So I do actually a bit of writing, um, byline writing, and um, I won't lie. Half the purpose of that is just to just to keep clips of some you know that are visible because right. you can't really count on people putting in passwords and contacting references and you know they want to the general you want to try make it easy for the for the people who are thinking about hiring you right yeah i mean it sounds like you almost have to just write something else on the side just to show them your writing style which is extra work and that can be that can be a huge amount of work when you're kind of spending burning the midnight oil on two ends writing for your clients but um you know i would say that at the current time um I have a friend actually who I just, it's just in my mind because I was speaking to him last week and he describes thinking of uh, the pandemic that it's, it's not going to just end in, you know, a few months or a year. If you can get into the mindset now that this is uh, going on for two or three years, then my friend whose name is Peter Duffy says that it's a, uh, it's a superpower. So I kind of, you know, if you, if you, if you want to get into the superpower mindset, um, mm-hmm. which is, I think, an awesome mindset to embrace, um, then you can, uh, you know, say you're just going to go really hard at this for six months and do ghostwriting projects and write on the site. And yes, I think that combination is probably what's needed. And uh, as you as you said, um, it's an awful lot of work to do those two things <laughs> yeah. simultaneously. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, we're kind of coming up on time. Is there anything else that you would want to talk about or is there kind of, I usually ask like one last piece of advice you would have for people trying to get into your industry? Uh, sure. I'd be, I mean, I'd be, I'd be happy to, happy, happy to, happy to share. So basically what I, what I would say is just to reiterate, um, that freelance writing is a, um, very, very big world. And right now, because of the coronavirus, um, there are a lot of people um, coming into it. So the, the supply side of the market in you know economic terms is being flooded at the moment. Right. Um, ghostwriting aside, and I'm saying ghostwriting aside just because, as I said, it's just a, a part of freelance writing. Uh, you know, the Venn diagram, it's part, it's, it's, it's part of the market. Um, I think it's really important now, and my advice would be for people to... Uh, focus on a uh, niche or niches and ones that are lucrative. So my niche is uh, technology and um, I'm, you know, I'm doing this like cloud certification, even though that seems like a really weird thing for a writer to be doing because it's a technology certification. Um, I'm doing that just because I want to have an extra credential for approaching cloud clients. So um, it's both a good time to be a freelance writer and also it's arguably a terrible time. Um <laughs> 
because rates have been under pressure for a while and with uh, budgets being constricted on the one side and uh, more supply in the market on the second side, that's going to put even further pressure and I'm seeing that happening right now. So I would say mm-hmm. it's always been true that people should uh, niche down, as they say, but it's never been truer than uh, it is at the moment for people to do that. So basically, you know, fi- you can find good freelance writing books out there on Amazon. I don't have any specific recommendations I really want to make, but... Um, find those books or a course and basically uh they'll most of them will advocate the same thing which is identifying two or three profitable niches niches uh researching them and uh just kind of working from there and as i said the more bylined work uh publicly accessible work you have out there to demonstrate that you don't have to get people clicking into your portfolios the better right well, great. That was great advice. And it was such an inter- interesting story to hear. So thanks for coming on and sharing. Sure. Uh, thank you very much for, for having me on the podcast. I'm glad to, uh, I'm, I'm glad to share. Can I, can I give, I mean, I guess if anyone has, has questions, I'd yeah. be happy to give my whatever contact details website. So my business website is dsrghostwriting.com. Um, and there's a contact form there. So if anybody does, so one of the things I really enjoy is, um, speaking to uh, speaking to writers, whether whether those writers are just coming in or they're already in. Um, mm-hmm. By in, I mean already doing it. So I actually have a calendly slot for peer to peer networking, and uh, whether people want you know just thoughts on getting into it beyond these thoughts, or they just are doing it and want to just like talk about writing and how it works out for them. I uh, I do those conversations maybe once every three months, just people whatever hit upon my page and click that. So always happy to, to speak with other writers and exchange exchange our, our both our notes and our uh, war stories. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Can you give us that website just one more time? Sure. Yeah. D D S R. So it's, it's basically my initials. My middle name is Simon D S R okay. uh, ghostwriting.com. And that's all together. One word. Perfect. And we'll put that on our social media and everything too. So if any listeners want to just be able to click it, we'll have that up. <laughs> cool. Great. Great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for, thanks for having me on. Bye. Thank you so much for listening. Head over to our website at careerjourneypodcast.com for more info, the latest episodes, and to join the discussion about careers. See you next time.